Hi everyone. Happy Wednesday. Um, it's good to be back here. Uh, this is Wellness Wednesdays. I'm going to try to do this every Wednesday and get someone um, in. And I want to get um, Dr. Keith Berkowitz in with us right now, who is here today. We're going to be talking about it and all about this tiny little gland, butterfly shaped gland, and why it's so important. Hi. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Sorry. Good morning to you. Good, yes, well, good afternoon to you in New York. Keith is over there. Are you in um, Manhattan or are you at home? I'm at home today. You're at home today. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, it's Wednesday. So I want to welcome Dr. Keith Berkowitz, uh, who I've been able to work with for the past 10 years, and we've worked with patients um, from all over the world. I can see we have people joining us from Germany. Anyone here from London? Uh, so anyways, we've just, this is such a good platform to discuss what we love to discuss, Keith. And uh, I wanted to talk about the thyroid today because it's something you and I see in practice all the time. And it's yes. really something that's not, that's misdiagnosed, that's, that's you know, underdiagnosed. And as well, there's a lot of people that are missed um, with this and then end up having a, a, a slew of other illnesses. Uh, let's start off by uh, talking about the misdiagnosis and what you've seen in practice. So it's really interesting. They, we think there's about 20 million individuals in the United States with thyroid disease. Mm -hmm. And what, what's interesting about that is 60% of the people that have it don't even know, yes. have never been diagnosed. And they think of women over their lifetime, one out of eight will actually develop low thyroid. Right. Sorry you about okay that. There. <laughs> Are we getting um, technical, technical difficulty? I know this filming at home is I. And then looking so, at yourself in this is really strange. <laughs> So what's interesting, so most of the people who have it actually have never been diagnosed with it. Right. And oftentimes the other issue is the way we do lab work, and we've always talked about that, is not always the most appropriate and not the most effective in making a diagnosis. Yeah, because there's that, uh, you know, there's a functional physiological range, which is a range where we want to see our patients. And, and there's a range that the, the, the archaic laboratory testing that's been done mainly on men, uh, Keith. A lot of these reference ranges have been based on men and a thyroid illness is mainly a woman illness. Uh, so it, it's interesting. And so we can't rely on these ranges. So if you go to your conventional medical doctor and they say to you, you know, you say to them, look, I've looked at all the symptoms of thyroid. I have fatigue, I have cold hands and feet. Um, you know, I get shivers, um, I can't lose weight. Um, all of those things are symptoms of an underactive thyroid. And when they go and get their thyroid checked, they get their results back from their, their doc and he or she, sh she says, oh, everything's fine. Everything's within the normal range. And of course, everything is in the normal range. But what does that range mean? You know what's interesting? This, I'm sorry to interrupt. What starts no, no, no. is actually, if you look at the lab result values, they don't yes. match the American College of Endocrinology guidelines right so, so the, the tsh irony. and a lot of labs still says yes. you can have a thyroid stimulant hormone level up to five 4.5 whereas yeah. the guidelines really is below three and right. so even the labs have not updated their guidelines yeah. to be effective and again in pregnancy they still show the same guidelines even though it's recommended to be less than 2.5 yeah in pregnancy that is where an a lot of things start. So let's take it from there. Let's start with, you know, women in uh, their 30s. Um, I'm seeing diagnosed with underactive thyroid. They're coming to see me and I'm sure, and, you know, it's not all about TSH. TSH is thyroid stimulating hormone. That doesn't mean anything. Just because that value is normal, it doesn't mean that the thyroid is normal. What do you, what do you see, uh, Keith? So first of all, I always think of one measurement is not a great data point. So no. you can have, for example, you can have a TSH of 2.5. If it was right. one a year ago, yeah. that's a big increase. Right. No, right. And that's number one. Number two is 
then we also have to measure what we call the breakdown of the hormones, which is T4 in its unbound form, which is free T4, and then also free T3, which is, and what's interesting, the thyroid gland makes 80% T4 and 20% T3 and relies right. on the conversion to T3 outside the thyroid, which is the effective part of the thyroid hormone on the other organs. Exactly. And in order for that to happen, I mean, we all talk about eating optimally, which is, which is super key. But we, unfortunately, you know, the nutrients in our food have become depleted. And we know from the World Agricultural Association that our levels of vitamins and minerals have been depleted. In particular, selenium has been depleted. So we're seeing more autoimmune conditions, um, you know, it's incredible. I mean, so what I want to do is break this down by talking about, you know, what is the thyroid? Why is it so important? Why are women having problems with weight gain and not able to lose weight no matter how much they change their diet? I want to start off with that, Keith, if we could. Sure. So I always call the thyroid the mother hormone. How appropriate, right, for women in that aspect? Because it controls so many different functions. It controls from temperature regulation to muscle function, to mood, to sleep, yeah. to sex drive, um, even things from fertility, your hormone regulation. It, it has such an impact on so many different things that people often have symptoms and may not realize those symptoms actually come from the thyroid. Exactly. And that's very common. It's very common. So what, what causes a thyroid to go off? So it's interesting. I would almost call the thyroid the most fragile organ in our body. So it's very effective by especially things like toxins. You know, you mentioned before selenium, not having enough nutrients like selenium, things like B2, B3, riboflavin, niacin, things like magnesium make a difference. That, and we've always talked about this every time we talk. Everything works together, right? You can't have one nutrient without the other to make a normal functioning Thyroid and the also, symphony of vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> I like I like that. Perfect. And what's interesting, also foods affected the way we eat. I mean, you mentioned before, we really don't get much iodine and selenium in our diet anymore. No. Why is that? I mean, the soil's been depleted, number one. And what's happening with the iodine situation? Why are we so deficient in iodine? So there there is some theories thinking about when the water was fluorinated with fluorine. Right. Fluorite, and that fluorite actually interferes with iodine absorption. That's one of the right. main reasons we see that. And if you actually remember years ago, they recommended the use of iodized salt so right. that actually people could replete it because they actually started seeing, I, I think it was back in the 70s, that people were starting to already be depleted in iodine. Right. And, you know, the whole connection with um, amino acids and vitamins and minerals, um, which I think we should come back to towards the end. I think we should continue on this journey with you know why are so many women affected by this and why is it predominantly in women and not men uh and what throws the thyroid off because I, I know whenever you and i just <laughs> case you'll always say that threw the thyroid off and I, I love it because it makes it's how we're trained as naturopathic doctors so the, i think that the theory behind women actually having more i think it has to do with the impact of sex hormones that it's so yeah. tied into sex hormones, and we talk about, you know, estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, you know, involvement with women. What's interesting, the most common form of, we would say, underactive thyroid is actually the autoimmune version, which yes. we often call Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And if you look over the, over the years, we've had really some major episodes that have triggered this. Yes. I have one of my colleagues who came from Poland, was around in Poland during the time of Chernobyl, and actually a lot of people who lived within hundreds of miles of Chernobyl developed an autoimmune thyroid or underactive thyroid, or we call thyroiditis or inflammatory thyroid. Yes. Japan, when they had the earthquake back in 2011, in the United States, the World Trade Center episode, we've actually seen more episodes than that. And interesting in my practice, I've seen more episodes of hypothyroidism in men than I've ever seen before where typically right. we would think of women. And actually what's interesting, in men, we often don't even think about checking it because we don't right. think of that as a, as a problem in, in men. But now it's a problem for everyone. And actually if, of all the autoimmune diseases, the most common is actually autoimmune thyroid. Right, it is. By and far. with men, what I do is, uh, 
when they have a lot of cardiovascular vascular, uh, stuff going on, um, I always check the thyroid because they're put on statins, they're put on all kinds of medication to lower their cholesterol. And I will put that, I will, you know, make sure I do a full thyroid panel. And lo and behold, they have a thyroid condition. As soon as I get that thyroid condition under control, there's no need to take a statin because the cholesterol levels and everything normalize. You know, the metabolism normalizes. It's, it's so, that's such an incredible gland and so important. And actually anyone who comes in with, especially symptoms of mood disorder, depression, anxiety, or high cholesterol, those are really, especially if they're good cholesterol or HDL is high, you have to really look at the thyroid first. You have to. And I was actually just talking with uh, you yesterday about statins. And I yeah. did some more research today. And it yeah. turns out statins interfere with selenium uptake by the body. So they can interfere with thyroid production. So the statins so. actually end up making the thyroid less functional than, Correct. You know, and, and, and so we see all these issues with muscle aches, you know, part of the side effects of statin drugs are muscle aches. So anyone out there on a statin drug, really speak to your naturopathic doctor and go to an integrative doctor like Keith, because this is so, so important to, to get your thyroid under control to get to the root cause. And you're always, and we've, we've always talked about this. It's the underlying process that has to be addressed first before That's what's true. over on top. So, it's like a house of cards. If the foundation's not good, it all falls down. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, your foundation is your diet and your lifestyle. But then all of a sudden, when you're getting, you know, when you're hitting your 40s, you're, I'm in, you know, my mid 40s now. And so it's like a hormone um, it's just like an explosion of hormones doing different things. I thought hormone storm. hormone storm, hormone storm. <laughs> hormone storm. Oh my God, that's a perfect name for it. It's, it's, it's crazy. And you can, you can really support your hormone balance. You know, there was a time where I suffered with uh, hypothyroidism and you were really great to, to sit with me and say, okay, this is what's going on with you. And, you know, it's hard to take care of yourself when you're in your own body. Um, so it was really great that you guided me in that area and you're the one that sort of helped me sort out my thyroid issue. Um, and it feels like almost everyone and their dog has a thyroid issue by the time they're hitting, you know. Sure, I mean, look at the growth of environmental toxins, right? Every day you read about another environmental toxin and that's yeah. leading to it. And, and you brought a great point up about hormones. Women who actually stop getting their period, have trouble with infertility, or have abnormal periods, you really need to look at the thyroid first. And that's really critical. Because that may be the underlying issue. It may not be a hormonal issue, or a so sex hormonal those, issue. For those listening out there, Keith, can you give everybody uh, the, the, the test that everybody should do? I mean, I, I, I prefer you say it than me. <laughs> so when we look at thyroid, we look at a couple of different things. We look at thyroid stimulating hormone. We talked about first. So thyroid stimulating hormone is what the pituitary sends a message to the thyroid. Hey, we need to make we need some thyroid hormone. So right. that's what happens. Then the thyroid gland itself makes T4 and T3. So T4, it's an 80 percent of it. And T3, as we said, was 20 percent. And that requires the body on the outside to convert that to T3, which is the active form. It's really important that we get the free T3 and the free T4 version as well. And, and on top of that, you, I would also do thyroid autoantibodies, both antithyroid globulin and thyroid peroxidase, because you can have a normal TSH with, with an autoimmune process because the signal that the body's signaling may not be appropriate. Right. So you may actually get a false reading. And even if people still suspect the thyroid issue, I may actually even go to an ultrasound of the thyroid. Absolutely. And what's really interesting Typically in autoimmune disease, you see a very typical picture on the thyroid ultrasound. You see something called, we call heterogeneous tissue. So there was a word homogeneous where everything looks alike and heterogeneous where it's not all the same. In autoimmune disease, it really shows a heterogeneous picture. So for everybody listening, write this down, TSH, T3, T4, free T3, T4. And you also wanna do TPO, uh, and you also want to make sure that you're, you're well, the other thing that I would make sure that you do is look at uh, magnesium levels as well. In addition, um, it's a really good um, addition to that kind of test. If your doc is able to do it, look at magnesium levels as well. And I would get magnesium RBC levels. 
So, yes, so yes. what a magnesium RBC is the magnesium in the red blood cell red is blood much cell. more accurate immersion than a regular serum magnesium level. Just sweet talk your dog into doing those tests. <laughs> you know, whatever you need to do, do it. Um, super important because these are going to be to the foundation of why you could be wired but tired, why you're getting muscle pain, why you're getting fatigue, why are you getting constipation, why are you gaining weight even though you're staying away from all the grains and eating like a saint, what is going on? And I guess the better you feel, the better you perform. I mean, that's really key. And again, we always talk about the thyroid also influences things like your blood sugar. We talked about your sex hormones. We talked about your sleep, cholesterol. And what's interesting, actually, there's a lot of studies showing an untreated thyroid increases dramatically the risk of heart disease. Right. Then people without it, and it does affect all those things. So by ignoring something in your 40s and 30s where things typically get diagnosed, you can pay the price in your 60s and 70s. Exactly. So now is the time to really look at these. And, you know, high antibodies indicate that there's inflammation. That means that, you, you know, you've not had the nutrients to your thyroid. You've also had, you know, potential environmental damage to the thyroid, stress, anxiety, all of those things. There is a cortisol and an adrenal connection to the thyroid, which I want to get into a little bit after. Uh, so, you know, these high end antibodies, we're seeing a lot of autoimmune conditions. And, you know, our environment is the, it's a very sensitive gland to the environment. You know, it's very, very delicate, sensitive, much like a woman, Keith. <laughs> That's why it's the mother's <laughs> gland. You know, we're very sensitive and we're very delicate. So I think that, you know, if you look at where, you know, first of all, what is your environment like? Are you also drinking out of plastic bottles? You know, that can really, really um, affect the thyroid. And, you know, what sort of creams and potions and lotions are putting on your skin because they absorb into your skin and they can cause hormone dysfunction. I've had a patient the other day, Keith, this is so interesting. Um, she's using some generic uh, brand store product. Um, I've had actually two patients, one that's not using a generic store brand cream, kind of like an oil of Olay type thing. And another person is using like a really high end product. And what I found is their E3 levels were through the roof and their E2 and E1 were low. So where are they getting that from? And most, more than often it's in your skincare. And so you have to be very careful that your skincare does not contain these types of hormones in them, even in small amounts. Um, we can get it from drinking water. I know in, when I used to live in the United Kingdom, there was high amounts of estrogen in the drinking water there. So, you know, you had a lot of men growing moose. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, 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 it's incredible what hormones can do in our body. Again, think of hormones as a symphony. And because we as women have more hormones than men, there's a lot more, um, you know, destruction that can happen, you know, in terms of weight gain, fatigue, depression, Le you know, lethargy, dry, itchy skin, huge symptoms of underactive thyroid. So what's interesting about the hormones also, we, thyroid, un untreated underactive thyroid can also cause your prolactin level to rise dramatically. Right. And that could de decrease your production of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and can really, to the point, stop your menstrual cycle. Which, and again, you know, it's interesting, whenever I see someone for workup of infertility, yeah. that's one of the first steps. And actually, even things from another end, migraines. So there is even literature on migraines that actually treating thyroid in people that are, have uncontrolled migraines and nothing else work can be sometimes effective. 100%. You know, in all my migraine patient sufferers, I'll do a full thyroid workup. And lo and behold, there will be something that's triggered. <laughs> and as soon as you get them on some thyroid support, they feel 100% better. The other question I get a lot from my patients is if you put a patient on something like nature thyroid or, you know, T3, can that person ever come off that thyroid medication? So I would look at it in two ways. If, if they have an autoimmune dis disease, right? So if right. that's, I would call that a primary thyroid problem. So right. then you're probably going to need medication for life. And the reason is your own thyroid hormone production does not really work properly because the gland is inflamed. So that group, yes. 
But if it's a secondary thyroid function, and we started talking about adrenals, right, for example. Right. So if your adrenals are affecting, or another case, insulin resistance or prediabetes can also affect thyroid function. Right. Long-standing chronic insomnia can affect thyroid function. So right. all those things, that group, if you actually correct the underlying this process, they can often get off the medication. And you forgot one group, which I'm shocked at, blood sugar. <laughs> I said uh, pre-diabetes. Did you say blood sugar? Okay, sorry, I wasn't listening. Then. And reactive hyperglycemia. I reactive hyperglycemia. Sorry, you are correct. That's what I was That is my for. favorite. <laughs> That's your favorite. It's so true. So, Keith, can you explain to people what a reactive hypoglycemia patient would feel like? And so, how? So, what reactive hypoglycemia really means, it's in reaction to. So, it's a reaction to a stress. So, that stress could be food or it could be cortisol, you know, yes. stress. And what happens is in response to that, the glucose would often rise, but your insulin levels, which is what responds to the glucose, will rise even further. And what right. it will cause is a, a crash in blood sugar, often one to two hours after the food or the stress happens. And I almost use the analogy of going to a gas station, filling up your car with gas, but there's a hole in the bottom of the tank. And I, and I always right. ask people, do you feel worse after you eat? And if the answer is yes, that most likely is reactive hypoglycemia. So a lot of things happen at, when you eat. So number one, your pancreas has to secrete all these enzymes, about one and a half liters a day, approximately. So number one, if you're dehydrated, this is gonna play a huge role in why you're getting this reactive hypoglycemia. Uh, and then also you have people that, you know, um, you know, have issues with their pancreas because they're eating the wrong foods, um, you know, they've been abusing, you know, alcohol, which I think all of us have been doing during this quarantine time. <laughs> and so I think all of those things can affect the pancreas and create hy a reactive hypoglycemia. I wonder how many cases of this we're going to see after this whole COVID. There's going to be a whole new classification to COVID disorders, blood COVID sugar, disorders. alcohol. Or <laughs> we'll need a, like, we'll need a center for like <laughs> post-traumatic stress COVID. <laughs> And, and we, we've talked about before inflammation and that really yes. the thyroid is very susceptible to that inflammation. So do you want me to talk about how um, insulin and cortisol affect thyroid? We, yes. I, maybe it's a good time. I've been so, waiting for this my whole life. <laughs> so what's interesting, we talk about, you know, everyone hears the word adrenal fatigue over and over yes. again, right? It's yes. a common thing. So what it really means is the adrenal glands are the way your body makes stress hormones. We call them right. glutocorticoids. And the main glutocorticoid we think about is cortisol, right? Everyone talks about cortisol. And what cortisol does when it's in very high levels, it actually prevents the body from converting T4 to the active form, which is T3. So it actually almost renders the thyroid non-functional. So oftentimes, and we've seen this before, people can have a normal TSH, but a very low T3. Right. And they actually have all the symptoms of an underactive thyroid, and they don't feel great. Which I was, I was telling... Nigma, a, a study the other day, there was a study done and they actually pulled individuals that were taking T3 versus not. Right. And, and what it turned out is the people that actually were taking the T3 supplementation felt better, but their numbers necessarily weren't better. So right. the, the, the conclusion to the study is what, you don't need T3. So when has not, when has feeling good become a negative? <laughs> I know, right? It's like, <laughs> what is going it's on? It's the new negative result in medicine. <laughs> so if you feel better, that's what counts. That's what counts. Forget about the test. And, and, and again, and people forget we give Synthroid to level thyroxine, which is pure T4. That is not physiologic. Our gland right. physiologically makes 80% T4 and 20% T3. Exactly. So we're actually violating the, law, violating the laws of physiology when right. we treat. Right. Which makes sense, actually. Uh, and so cortisol, I'm sorry, to, the last part is cortisol also causes reverse T3 to go up. So right. the other problem with re reverse T3 is another lab we can also measure. And what ha and a high level of reverse T3 means underactive thyroid. And so what happens is that competes with free T3. So the higher reverse uptake of T3 is, the lower the level of free T3. Right. And that can all be caused by cortisol. So stress really makes a difference. Oh yeah, so what cortisol is, is we have these cute little adrenal glands 
that sit right on top of our kidneys and they secrete hormones, DHEA, cortisol, adrenal hormones. And what they do is when we get stressed out, these hormones can rise. First thing in the morning, the hormones should be the highest. So we should be waking up in the morning and feeling super refreshed. You know that commercial zest fully clean, everybody, the whole family's running around in the morning, jumping on the beds and everything. You should be feeling like that in the morning. If you are not feeling like that in the morning, chances are your cortisol levels are low. You then go on to your noon levels where they should drop and then they should drop and keep pretty consistent at a, a lower level throughout noon and afternoon. And then come midnight, they should be very close to, to zero, but not zero. And that is the sign of a good hormone, a, a cortisol test result. When I see the cortisol levels flatlined, Keith, tell me, you know, talk about like cortisol levels that have been completely flat from morning to midnight. So usually that happens, that's, that's a long-term process. So we talked about adrenal fatigue. Yes. By the time your cortisol burns out, your body's not really able to react to stress properly. Right. And we always joke about stress, right? You want to have some reaction to stress, otherwise you, you can't do. move. Right. right? You, you're <laughs> no <laughs> you're stuck in bed, you won't be able to move. And that really creates tremendous fatigue. And that makes it very difficult. If you start with zero energy, that's yeah. not going up as the day goes on. That's only going down. And that's where a lot of people suffer from. Or the other thing we talk about is, a re I call it a reverse cortisol cycle, where it's high, higher at night and low in the morning. And people have often trouble slowing down or calming down and actually sleeping because of that. Right. So I want to, before we go to our Q and A's, um, I want to talk about, you know, we're going to be answering some of your questions very soon. Um, I wanted to talk about vitamins because that's right up my alley. Vitamins and minerals for the thyroid. So vitamin A, C, E, zinc, selenium, really important, magnesium, iodine. All of these are super, super important in helping the thyroid and helping the conversion of you know, T3 and T4. These are super, super important. Without these vitamins, our thyroid is not able to con uh, to. to to, to work optimally. And that's why when we see people with really poor diets or even people who are trying to eat well aren't getting those nutrients because they're having a problem with their digestion. Remember, everything <laughs> starts in the gut. So if you're not digesting well, you're not gonna absorb those nutrients. So, um, and also vitamin D. Vitamin D is super important. There's so much around vitamin D and thyroid. Um, issues. And as soon as I get my patients on vitamin D, I see improved results in their thyroid. And exactly what you said, Keith, they start, they report that they're feeling better. So what's interesting about that is actually, they've done studies on the gut and thyroid, they actually, they suspect 70 to 80% of people with just normal hypothyroid, not necessarily autoimmune, have digestive problems. And I, we suspect that probably 100% of people with the autoimmune version probably have a digestive problem. And that's probably one of the major triggers of autoimmune disease. And what's so important about that, if that's not corrected, the risk of a second and a third and a fourth autoimmune disease is much, much greater. Much and we're greater. seeing more and more cases of that than ever before. And at a younger age, yes. people developing it as well. Oh, yes. We're seeing people develop it at, at age 12 now. I have patients that are 12 years old that have autoimmune thyroid conditions. So it's, um, it's very interesting. Uh, I want to go on. Uh, Keith, did we miss anything? Did you want to add anything before we go to the, the question and answers? Oh, one last point about insulin and glucose. So yes. the other thing that impacts T4 to T3 conversion is actually insulin resistance. So right. high levels of insulin will stop that conversion and also, in a sense, render almost the thyroid inactive, right? So your TSH, right. again, could be normal. But if T3 is not there in, in its unbound form, the organs around the body, which really require a thyroid to work, will not see it. And one thing I want to add about thyroid for all of you guys, if I can try to seduce all of you to get your thyroid working optimally, <laughs> is some things you can look at on your skin. You know how I, how I have the four faces of aging, dairy face, gluten face, wine face, and sugar face. In the same thing, there is a thyroid face, right, Keith? We talk about this, you and I. So you get the puffiness around the eyelids and underneath here. And that is a sign that the thyroid, that's how I know if my thyroid is a bit off. 
Besides and also doing low energy. And also the outer third of your eyebrows disappear. Yes, yes. That's my favorite party question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you you see someone who's who's losing their outer part of their eyebrows, that is very commonly a sign of an underactive thyroid. It's all in the eyes. <laughs> And dry okay. skin, and very dry skin as well. Really dry, itchy, kind of scaly skin. It's like you're putting tons of moisturizer on your body after showers, and you're like, you should not need to moisturize your body that and, much. And one of the biggest causes of hair loss and hair thinning as well, too, which is really important. Which is really, really important. Anytime a patient has some, you know, hair loss happening, I will always look at um, the thyroid. Okay, so... Let's go to our, this, gosh, this goes by fast every time, Keith. I just want to <laughs> talk to you forever. Okay, so can you discuss having normal free 3T and T4, but low TSH? So a normal free T3 and a normal free T4 and a low TSH. So a low TSH can often be suppressed by different things. Yeah. One of the things you always want to look at is something like hypothyroid, for example. So Graves' disease, which is a common form of autoimmune thyroid as well, but in the opposite end of the spectrum. The other thing sometimes can happen is certain medications can also suppress thyroid function as well. And again, TSH, when it's elevated, is often hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid. When it's low, it's hyperthyroid or an overactive thyroid. This would be something to recheck again in about two to three months. Maybe try changing your diet and you know, follow the plan in my book, if you can, it's called Younger Skin Starts in the Gut, because it's, the plan in my book is really good at helping um, the thyroid. It's, it's an anti-inflammatory diet, basically. So, um, you know, getting your blood sugar uh, in order as well, you know, reading Keith's book in that respect. So, you know, we, we can put some things on a, on a story for some references for you. So the other two things I would do is I would also do antibodies in that case, because Graves' disease is also right. an autoimmune with elevated. And if that's not conclusive, then that's where you want to kind of look at tissue, which right. is thyroid ultrasound. So what is the best approach to start healing the thyroid for weight gain? So I, I kind of look at it in a way I would look at three things together. So I would look at and I, kind of the triumph of, of weight gain which is hormones, which is your sex hormones and thyroid hormone, blood sugar and digestion. I think when you work on all three of those together and, and repair and also supplement properly, that's the most effective. I find oftentimes when people only look at the thyroid and only treat the thyroid, they're actually missing the other two aspects and they don't necessarily improve or get better. So what foods to eat for the thyroid? Um, we can look at, you and I can play off this together. We can okay. look at things like kale, which is rich in magnesium, any green leafy vegetables. Remember, we need magnesium. Magnesium is part of the Krebs cycle, which is our mitochondria cycle. We need that in order to function. The other thing is um, meats. We know that um, organ meats, you know, chicken, um, you know, uh, also we, you, you talked about liver, um, being really important. I don't know how many people eat liver, but <laughs> chicken, so, you know, rich in, rich in amino acids um, and, and also rich in selenium. Remember we talked right. about selenium being super deficient. So the foods that are rich in iodine, which is the other part, are things like seafood, uh, seaweed, yes. which is probably the highest, and dairy products. So also on the selenium, I would also look at things like eggs is another example that's something yes. that's helpful as well. Yeah, eggs and, and seaweed. Um, we, we look at a lot of, you know, Japanese diets and they have, you know, rich in seaweed diet. And seaweed by at, far, I'm sorry, is, is the highest level of iodine of any of the foods. It's by far. It's by far. The Japan, it'd be interesting to look at the Japanese rates of thyroid. I used to know this information and I can't remember it now. But um, it'd be interesting to look at their thyroid um, con issues, their rates, and, sp and particularly in women. Um, okay. Any other questions? There was a question before. Uh, there was a question before by uh, somebody about their thyroid going up and down, like a yo-yo effect. And, you know, that is super, that, that can happen quite often when, you know, you have fluctuating blood sugar levels. Keith, do you want to uh, elaborate on that? Because you're really Sure. Good. TSH or thyroid stimulant hormone is actually what we call an acute phase reactant. And what that means in English is it is affected by other stresses. For example, if you had someone in the hospital 
you can measure thyroid stimulant home on a Monday and it could yes. be very different on Tuesday, depending yeah. on what recovery phase they're in. So that's why I always kind of stress having multiple data points to make a proper diagnosis. Because, and again, looking at the other things together with it, which is T, free T3, free T4, and your thyroid antibodies to see what that means. And again, if it is fluctuating up and down, you want to also look at other things that may be interfering with that production, foods or medications or supplements that can be impacting that. Okay, can probiotics actually make the gut microbiome better populated? Can the bacteria withstand a uh, it withstand the acidic environment before it? Hmm, does I don't see the rest of this. Well, to start off with, probiotics can um, help uh, the gut uh, population for sure because when we look at um, the gut microbiome, when you have the, the, the right amount of good bacteria in there, you can actually increase your absorption and production of vitamins, in particular B vitamins. And we see that over and over again in people who take probiotics, that they're actually able to absorb these B vitamins from their foods. So super important to take probiotics in this particular And we situation. talked about before vitamin K, Ligma and I. So vitamin yes. K is produced oftentimes by your gut bacteria, and that's really critical for function of your thyroid for your function of your blood vessels, for your blood sugar, for your bones, really very important molecule. I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people out there are just taking vitamin D3 on its own and it's not a good idea to do that. You should be taking D3 alongside with K1 and K2 because you're gonna get the maximum benefits. Also, it's gonna be a safer way of taking vitamin D than just D3 alone. And, and you're at risk of creating the deficiency, right? If you're not put in balance. I love what you said before. It's a vitamin sympathy you know yeah. concert all together awesome it's all together always <laughs> working always working in harmony together that's like you and i keith that's why i love you so much <laughs> you're my partner in crime uh keith and i have regular discussions all the way we're gonna take one more question can you take one more question keith and then sure okay we have time for one more question let's see what the question is I feel like this is Jeopardy or something. <laughs> would, for $800. Uh, for $800, <laughs> would a multivitamin cover all the vitamins needed? Well, it depends on the kind of uh, multivitamin. Not, not all multivitamins are created equally. I created um, a product called Beauty in a Bottle. And I did it for selfish reasons because I wanted my skin to look clear and I wanted the hydration of my skin to start from the inside. And so Beauty in a Bottle contains vitamin A, C, E, zinc, selenium, hyaluronic acid, MSM, all the ingredients you need for support. And I always, and it has iodine in it as well. So this is, I give my patients this because whenever I, I put them on a thyroid program, I give them the Beauty in a Bottle and I always get excellent results. That's why I pretty much created it, but I also created it for for, for, for skin care as well. And then also the vitamin D sun, which has vitamin D with K1 and K2. So it's hard to say there are a lot of amazing multivitamins out there. Um, uh, you know, just maybe check with your naturopathic doctor or your nutritionist and double checking you're getting the right vitamins. And also what doses you need for what issues you're dealing with. That's really right. important because, you know, it's not only from a supplement problem, but it's also a treatment protocol, right? Vitamins yes. and minerals can be in treatment level doses. So those doses are often greater than what would be found in a multivitamin. Exactly. And because of this wonderful lecture today, I've got, um, I've got a discount on my Instagram. It's called uh, Beauty Sun. So at checkout, just type in Beauty Sun. I'm donating a proceed of that to Black Lives Matters. Black Lives Matter, and that's going to be from Keith and I as a little thank you uh, for coming on today. Uh, and I think we have answered all the questions. One last one is kombucha good. It's a catch-22. Um, there's a lot of sugar in kombucha. So, and caffeine. And caffeine. So you, you, you don't want to roll up. Thank you. You don't want to roll up the, you know, the thyroid. Everybody you know, thinks that kombucha and some of these, you know, things are, are good to take in copious amounts, but it can actually put you in a cortisol spin. Can I bring one more thing about the, uh, iodine I want to talk about? Yes, yes, so yes, we yes. Didn't, I often sometimes measure iodine levels as well. And in women's health, it's really critical. So there's a lot of literature now showing that cystic breast tissue occurs 
in women that have low iodine. That right. can be a risk factor, and yes. actually, just enough a risk factor for breast cancer. So iodine not only has an impact on thyroid function, we were saying before it has a very high impact on hormone function and sex hormone function. Yeah, and breast tissue. Thank you so much for bringing that up. That is, <laughs> not a lot of doctors know this, so it's 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 so great. Thank but you. I learned so much from you. <laughs> You make me look good. <laughs> Whatever. I think it's, I, I love working with you. I think we, we're a great team. And, and we're going to do this Wednesday, uh, Wellness Wednesdays every Wednesday. If you guys want to do that, and if so, can you guys uh, DM me and Keith and tell us what you want us to talk about? Because we'd love to do this every Wednesday with you if you want to. Um, just let us know what you want to hear, and we'll do it. All right. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and be well uh, until next week. Thank you so much and be safe. All right. You too. Take care. Bye-bye.